Hello, everybody. Um, we're just going to give it another minute or two. If you guys want to um, start putting your name and organization in the chat, and we will get started momentarily. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here um, today. Um, as we get started, if I can ask you all to please go ahead and put your name and your organization into the chat. Um, while I start with the introduction, uh, today is our first global information session on waste management. Um, so I'm very delighted that you all could join us today for this quite acute uh, topic to discuss. Um, my name is Catherine Ely. I am the project manager for the REC project, and the REC project stands for Waste Management and Measuring, Reverse Logistics, Environmentally Sustainable Procurement and Transport, and Circular Economy. So we'll just call it the REC project. Um, today's agenda, I will very, very briefly give you a, a welcome today and introduction, and then I will hand over to my colleague Marta, who's going to walk us through waste management in the emergency uh, in emergency operations. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then we'll get some donors perspectives from uh, our colleagues from DG Echo and USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Affair Assistance um, on waste management in emergency operations. Go into some group discussion, so we will do breakout rooms. And then we'll open the floor for Q&A and wrap up and next steps. So I do want to go ahead and introduce what the REC project is, if you haven't heard of us um, before, but super, super briefly. Um, <clears throat> the REC project is led by the Global Logistics Cluster with a, uh, a group of coalition partners from the Danish Refugee Council, IFRC, Save the Children, and the UN World Food Program. And essentially what we're doing is we're focusing on waste and greenhouse gas emissions to support humanitarian supply chain practitioners in the field with an impact reduction. Our ultimate goal is to have sustained adoption of best environmental practices across the humanitarian logistics and supply chain community. And so we uh, hold a number of information sessions like the one you've joined us here for today to share best practices, but also uh, to get your feedback in terms of what you need, what some gaps and challenges are, and how we can support you best. So for uh, the objectives of the session today, we want to raise awareness with you all in terms of environmental standards on solid waste management and humanitarian emergencies. So my colleague Marta is going to start walking us through that, um, and our donor perspective perspectives on that will also sort of help contextualize some of the issues related to solid waste management in emergencies. But it's not just about listening to us. It's not just about hearing from you know, experts in the field. It's about listening to you as well. So what we uh, hope to do during those breakout sessions is to collect insights on how you can comply with these standards and what you need. So identifying some of the gaps that you have um, and how we as the REC project can support you with uh, overcoming some of those challenges and really engaging you all in how to uh, participate in better waste management. So we will also have a wrap up and uh, Art is gonna walk us through what we're gonna be doing in terms of waste management coordination meetings um, in the future, but that's uh, that's the next step towards the end of the call. So if I may, um, I will go ahead and hand over to my colleague, Marta, to take us through the first session. Marta. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, hi to everyone. 
So uh, as Catherine mentioned, today we want to talk about waste management in emergencies and also the importance of uh, minimizing the generation of waste, recovering, and also uh, deciding what to do with the waste that we cannot recover, how to dispose it in a proper way uh, to reduce all the environmental, but also health and climate uh, impacts. Uh, very often, the emergency operations happens in places where there are limited number of infrastructure to um, recycle, but also to dispose properly uh, without any environmental impact. Um, and um, and then uh, the this is the question we wanted to, to talk today is uh, uh, how we can address the challenge uh, on 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 solid waste um, because. Um, um, it's clear how we want to, or how we can uh, approach waste, but most of the times in, in practice, at uh, the practice, uh, we cannot, uh, we don't find uh, the waste. And then um, this is the, the key question we want to ask. So what is missing uh, for the logistics perspective, but also what is missing in the, uh, the humanitarian sector? Uh, if we need to uh, strengthen coordination at field level, on waste management, if we need to go for more infrastructures, uh, if we need to engage other actors like uh, development actors, environmental actors, or private sector. So this is uh, what we would like to discuss today. Uh, before we start the discussion, I want to introduce the topic of uh, waste management in emergencies. And the first topic or the first thing we wanted to talk is the waste management standards. So which are the minimum uh, environmental standards on solid waste that we are committed as humanitarians. And we believe that there are three groups of standards. Uh, the first one would be um, the country specific waste management uh, regulations and global conventions and agreements. Uh, in this, uh, every country has their own national uh, laws and legislations where it explains how waste needs to be collected, uh, transported and disposed. More specific or more uh, strict uh, regulations on hazardous waste like uh, medical waste or chemicals. And also um, more recently there are countries that they are also banning the use of single use plastics. Um, another group is the, the humanitarian um, standards uh, that uh, we have as an example, the do no harm principle uh, that tells us that we cannot harm, uh, we should not harm the communities and the environment of the communities that we are assisting. Then we also have the sphere standards. This is an important document. It tells us how to um, organize uh, waste management systems in the uh, humanitarian responses how waste needs to be collected, uh, transported, and finally disposed in a safely manner, uh, including the recovery of some materials. Also, in this document, uh, highlights the importance of coordination of the different uh, clusters or sectors uh, of, on solid waste. And there's a lot of guidelines and uh, documents that many agencies have been developed for different types of waste streams in, in many countries. And then the third group of standards comes from the donors' uh, policies. Uh, they are including environmental requirements, uh, not only on the general response, but also on, on the specific um, supply chain policies. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So the, the three group of uh, standards, we would say that uh, we agree and also we include also the, the red project on, on this uh, waste management hierarchy that I'm sure that you uh, already have seen before that prioritize uh, how we have to approach the waste in, in, in any intervention. So um, starting by reducing to zero the generation of waste, if not possible, try to reuse, if not possible, repurpose or recycle. Uh, up to the the last option that would be disposal. So if we go to the next slide, we can uh, we put here some examples. So the the entire community is working a lot, putting a lot of efforts on uh, reducing. Uh, this is more developed at the procurement phase, uh, where um, the right uh, criteria, the right technical specifications, right policies on procurement, environmental sustainability procurement are being in place to try to minimize 
but also to simplify the composition of packaging and the uh, items to make it more easy at the field level for recycling or to manage these items. In the next slide, we see also another group of, if not possible to reduce, we can try to supply packaging that is reusable or maybe that we can repurpose or that we can also recycle. And in the case of the organic, uh, organic waste, we can compost. Um, and here uh, we have hi highlighted the, the effort that the logistics cluster and the partners are doing on mapping all the recycling companies in the different countries of operation. Then we go to the next two last steps. If it's not possible to uh, uh, follow these uh, previous uh, principles, we can always try to recover the energy that contains waste. And here we put some examples on uh, biogas production made of uh, out of the organic waste and also this other technology that's called gas gasifier that we have some example in cox's bazaar that's uh, in cox's bazaar it's mixing also with the fecal material but it's uh, another way to manage the waste without generating additional impacts to the environment and finally we have disposal so uh, but environmentally friendly disposal means that is uh, landfills and three landfills that has the uh, measures to reduce any impact to the environment. Um, and then also all the hazardous waste needs a specific treatment before uh, to remove all the toxicity before it's disposed or recycled. What happened in the in the in general, what we find is that there is a lot of uh, good initiatives to reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. We have very, very few examples of energy recovery and disposal treatment when possible but there's a lot of efforts but also this is quite limited but there's a still a big amount of waste that cannot fit in into any of these steps and is still damp or burn or maybe it's collected by municipality or collected by some uh, private companies but uh, it's damp in landfills but are not environmentally friendly so still the waste is generating certain impacts to the environment so in the next slide, um, here we, we wanted to look at more at the organization level. And if we look at the waste management along the uh, humanitarian supply chain, we can uh, differentiate different type of waste and share responsibilities among the different departments or units of, of the organization. If we look, for instance, at, at procurement phase, uh, we we see procurement and uh, programs teams that they are working together to define all the technical specifications, introducing environmental criteria into the uh, relief items. Then when it goes to transportation, the logisticians also look at the hazardous waste that usually is generated at the fleet management. When we go to the warehouse at storing, also logisticians not only look at packaging waste, but also at other stocks that may be expired or may be damaged or may be uh, no, no longer used in that area. And finally, at the distribution point, uh, we put the offices here, but also a lot of uh, items are necessary at offices uh, where there's uh, electronic and uh, electric and electronic waste and also other domestic waste that admin has to take uh, a responsibility and finally, at the field level, um, programs again take re the responsibility to distribute the, the items, but also look at how the after consumption, uh, if this packaging or other type of waste, how it is managed, they can do it directly or maybe indirectly. Uh, there are other systems in place that they can take it um, and manage it. Yeah, and uh, that's... Um, so in addition to the, the limitations, there are other constraints that happen when we are operating, depending if it's at the beginning of the crisis, we in, in the more acute phase, uh, the beginning, like the first hours or first months, um, and or we are operating more on the recovery phase from the third, fourth month or in protected crisis. But regardless the um, the limitations, we still, uh, there are things that we can still do in the, in the field. During the acute crisis, we still can collect the waste, maybe store it and leave it there until we have the time to manage. Um, 
it's a good time also to start with the rapid environmental assessments to understand with the existing uh, infrastructure, the existing practices that are in place to start planning more uh, long term or more recovery phase interventions. And of course, if the organizations already have their uh, waste management policies and procedures in place with the trained staff at field level, uh, these practices are more uh, yeah, easy to happen. But then when we are the recovery phase, then it's time to set up some value chain initiatives to recover waste, like composting or recycling, uh, maybe construct some uh, safe disposal infrastructure, and also engage other actors, development actors, government, um, for a more long term, uh, with a long term objective. And here we don't have time to share this video, but uh, uh, the colleagues in Cox's Bazaar, the, the waste sector colleagues, they released this video. It's a good example how the waste is managed in, a, in, the, in the Rohingya crisis. That's about 1 million uh, refugees. And uh, you can see this through the video how waste is collected from the, the households, from the source, is transported into facilities, is segregated by different waste streams. They produce compost, they produce the, the recyclables are sold to the market and then items that cannot be recycled like plastic bags, they set up some kind of recycling facilities in the camps and the waste that cannot be um, recovered, it's transferred to a sanitary landfill that has uh, proper environmental measures. And also, it's not mentioned in the video, but there is a, a waste management strategy for the whole response, which I think is good because all the different sectors know how to manage the waste. And there is an intersector waste management group where all the sector leads are um, uh, um, coordinated to, to deal with the waste management issues. So I will uh, leave here. That was the initial introduction that I hope it was helpful to start uh, the discussion in a minute. But first, we want to hear from our guests, um, Anja and Pablo. Uh, we want to hear from donor perspective on how they uh, expect, how they are promoting the management of waste in operations. So our first speaker would be Anja Pirjevic. She works for the DG ECHO on the disaster risk management and prevention, the prevention disaster risk management uh, unit at the regional office of Eastern and Southern Africa in Nairobi. So, Anja, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for the, the invite. And I have to say, it's really nice to see uh, so many female experts uh, working on and being very passionate about uh, waste. So I guess the sector is changing a little bit and it's a, it's a nice thing. Um, yeah, so I will start, you can go already to the, to the second slide. Yes, thanks. Uh, I will just switch off the video here because the connection is coming and going. I will put it back on later. Um, yeah, so just quickly, um, as you already talked about the, the standards, um, we have recently rolled out our uh, minimum environmental requirements, and I was initially going to talk about only the, the, the group of requirements uh, under the cross-cutting um, side, which is actually the first six groups on the left side of the screen. Um, but then I realized that actually we have requirements uh, directly tackling waste in several other under several other sectors, um, which uh, obviously showcases the, um, the importance of um, sustainable solid waste management. And also uh, it showcases uh, that basically every response that we finance uh, is one of the things that we should definitely uh, assess and find solutions because it really tackles um, every action, every activity um, that we deliver to the beneficiaries in, in the field. Um, maybe just quickly, I can go through the main, uh, the main yeah, topics that we want to, or activities that we want to support through the implementation of this requirement. And one is for sure, uh, either the establishment or the upgrading of uh, existing systems or practices. This could be formal or informal. It could be public 
or privately owned. The idea is not always to, you know, push a humanitarian organization to set up new systems, but to first map what exists in uh, in a specific location and then try to integrate um, the ways that it's produced uh, in a humanitarian site or settlement into that uh, systems. What we have noticed until now, through also the project that we fund, is that there are many, many initiatives, uh, the majority very small scale, uh, low budget, low tech, uh, that can actually uh, bring a positive impact in terms of um, specifically solid waste that is produced in, in, in humanitarian settlements. Um, next, um, we also, of course, want to tackle, no, no, sorry, sorry, we stayed in the, yes. Um, we want to tackle also the waste before it reaches the, the field. Uh, so a set of our requirements under the supply chain um, uh, chapter um, wants to actually uh, wants to see the current uh, NFIs uh, that are delivered to the beneficiaries uh, to be a bit, uh, let's say, reviewed, revised um, to be more sustainable. This can be uh, by um, extending the, the lifespan of the items. It can be um, by incorporating items that have smaller plastic content or that uh, are made by biodegradable materials or that have um, some percentage of recycled content in it. Um, Next, of course, the packaging of these items uh, is very important. Uh, so the reduction specifically of single-use uh, items is also very important and it's included in the in the requirement. So it's not only about managing the waste once it reaches the, the field, which is basically saying we um, we transfer the responsibility, you know, of our response um, to the beneficiaries. So we want to also maybe prevent as much as possible uh, what reaches uh, the field and it's not maybe necessary um, to be sent there. Um, we also want to support uh, enterprises that we do, that they do um, up or down cycling, uh, composting and maybe incorporate these activities into some sort of um, livelihood activities. Uh, we uh, support very much uh, waste valorization initiatives, especially small scale ones. Uh, obviously, not much data exists um, in terms of the whole life cycle analysis um, of, you know, um, what is more sustainable. Um, but we still feel that um, when uh, an initiative is small scale uh, and uh, it provides also benefits in terms of livelihoods, it's uh, much better than just, you know, burning uh, waste in the site, which um, provokes all sorts of other issues, including health. Um, then we have a set of requirements on medical and nutrition um, under the medical and nutrition sector, which basically um, regulates a little bit how this way should be treated and specifically in terms of medical waste. Uh, we think it's very important to start sorting better and segregate better the waste that it produced there because a big chunk of the waste that it currently burned in incinerators, usually very low quality incinerators, can be actually separated and uh, then upcycled or downcycled. Um, and finally, yes, we do even currently support several initiatives that work um, in the context of waste to energy transformation. Uh, we have, for example, uh, a project with the Swedish Red Cross um, where they're trying to test and to pilot um, deployable gasification unit that uh, would be possible to deploy in emergency um, context for the first three months and which would take care of the um, waste um, before the actual more long-term uh, systems can be put in place. Uh, we'll let you know how this uh, experiment uh, 
because it is actually an experiment. It doesn't exist until now, uh, especially in terms of deployability. So we'll see how um, how it works out. We are currently in the assessment stage, and uh, we are also planning to do the whole life cycle analysis, uh, meaning that we want to see the actual impact of the gasification unit versus more, um, let's say, conventional um, systems that are uh, implemented now in humanitarian uh, context. You can now go to the next slide. So this is this is just uh, one of the um, uh, consequences that we try to prevent. Basically, uh, we as DG Echo are really tackling the waste uh, that is produced um, through our humanitarian response. So we are not uh, we didn't um, roll out the tackle you know uh, ways that it's uh, produced outside of the humanitarian response we really want to make that uh, our uh, projects the project fun greener basically and then i think in the next slide we also have uh yes so this is for example a case in iraq with um, many many discarded um, tents this is what we're trying to um to prevent and actually when i was talking about having requirements that tackle directly waste under uh, many sectors, also under the shelter and settlement. We have requirements that tackle um, construction materials, um, the way how the buildings and shelters are um, uh, constructed and so on, because uh, waste is not only, you know, um, what we can see as waste visually, but it has to do a lot uh, with mainstreaming and how we do actually um, our response in general. Next. Yeah, so now I'm I'm going to go very quickly through just some cases that we currently fund uh, or um, we would like to fund in the next uh, HIP exercise. You can already go to the next. Yeah, so for example, we are, this is a case from Takuma. Uh, it's a waste segregation and collection center. Um, we fund several similar initiatives around the world. Uh, the idea is not uh, necessarily to produce, to set up a plant that recycles on site. Uh, as you can see, they do, the refugees do produce here some items that are then sold in the market, but the big majority of this plastic is actually sold to uh, recycling plants in, in Nairobi. So there are different ways of uh, actually then tackling the waste that is collected and sorted. Not necessarily we need to build these um, um, factories on site in refugee camps, which might be challenging, but we can find, you know, ways of channel it uh, more appropriately. Next. Yeah, this is the, so, uh, Today, uh, you guys already mentioned Bangladesh. This is from uh, uh, my one of my missions there. Uh, it's, for example, an upcycling um, center where they use the nutrition um, sachet and they transform it in different um, items that then can be used or sold. Or uh, yeah, so the the we have actually various projects that tackle the um, nut uh, sachet. So I think we'll see one in the next slide. You can go on. I oh, know this is another example from Bangladesh. Uh, this is what I was mentioning before about tackling the supply chain as well. So for example, um, providing items, food or non-food items in packaging that um, is made by natural biodegradable materials versus uh, plastic. Uh, is already a big step forward uh, in terms of environment because usually uh, we find this packaging then uh, either burned on site or discarded because it is uh, made from a very um, a type of plastic that it's not easily recyclable. So, for example, this type of plastic, um, different types of bags, they would not be uh, appropriate to sell uh, to big recycling plants. So, they usually is the plastic that... Um, stays uh, in the sites and yeah gets burnt or eaten by different livestock so yeah uh, tackling this from already the beginning of the supply chain it's actually a much better solution next so this is uh, for example the other project that we have uh, with alima in uh, in chad um, where they actually use the plumpy nut sachet so the families bring back 
um, the sachet that they use through the nutrition program. They are collected, stored, and then a small uh, local uh, enterprise is uh, upcycling them into uh, different construction agglom agglomerates through a very low-tech melting process. Um, and then this material is mixed with different construction materials and, and used for different uh, purposes. And by actually solving um, an environmental problem here, for example, they also offer construction materials for a lower uh, price. Next. Yeah, this is a case also with Alima, with another project in Burkina. Uh, where we use um, different types of plastic gathered in humanitarian sites um, and also the plumpinat sachet, uh, which are then um, transformed through the process of pyrolysis into, um, into LPG and, and diesel fuel. Obviously, this is again a very low-tech solution and we don't have a life cycle analysis to really compare um, how sustainable this is because obviously um, the outcome of this process is LPG which will be used for cooking and diesel which will be used for vehicles and we know that both are uh, polluting however what is then um, compared to that what is the cost of leaving these um, bags in the in the sites uh, which then uh, disintegrate enter soils water and so on so uh, but hopefully our project with the um, swedish red cross will put a bit more of light to to that but for now we 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 want to think that it's still a better uh, solution than um, leaving the waste uh, in sites and to be burned and eaten by 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 goats and so on. Um, and by the way, uh, because the uh, pyrolysis works through a process of very high temperature, there is no combustion. So uh, the smoke and volatile particles are very low. So it's already a good start. You can go to the next one. Yes, and these are some examples of uh, how we promote in different humanitarian settlements, the use of organic waste to produce briquettes. In some cases, they are um, non-carbonized briquettes, meaning they use only organic material. And in some other case, um, we have in Kenya, where a women cooperative uses also um, charcoal dust, which they gather for free from sites where they sell charcoal, and they mix it into the recipe um, for the briquettes. All these briquettes are uh, obviously tested um, to understand the actual energy output. Um, and this is very important also in all of this process to actually um, support data-driven um, yeah, solutions. So we know exactly uh, what we are doing and what are the actual outputs of it to not make the mistake of doing maybe more harm in the end. Next, I'm not sure if there's still something. I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anja. Thanks so much. I mean, do you just uh, gather a lot of examples that are uh, very illustrative uh, of uh, to, to examples that are fitting into the different uh, steps or principles of the pyramid of the waste management. So I think that was super uh, useful to to understand much better uh, how we can apply this uh, um, this pyramid or, or this diagram. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward to see uh, the results of the gasification uh, and uh, good examples on waste to energy, pyrologies, and also these briquettes. So uh, I think that was, um, uh, yeah, good, good uh, examples I didn't know. So I'm very happy to see them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Angela. And then now we want to uh, also give the floor to um, Pablo. Pablo is uh, from uh, USA. Bureau of uh, for the humanitarian assistance, and he's uh, also um, supporting is the team lead at the Latin American uh, countries uh, supply chains division. And uh, Pablo, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on you are where you are. Uh, this is. Very nice uh, presentation, Anja. Uh, thank you very much for all this material. I was just thinking, um, like, also, like, if we, you know, this back, this 
if we look back like six years ago, none of this like what Ashley was talking about, like humanitarian logistics. I recall like Rosalind still in the field as a logistician. I'd never seen it before, actually. But uh, you know, it's it's a good thing we're talking about, and uh, also from from a donor perspective, all the way to the field, this is something that's approached, being approached, and um, and also hopefully, you know, we go into the upward trend of like being not something that is just you know just a, a few of us, 54 of us, but something that's just basically commonly applied through and through humanitarian operations. All right, so on behalf of BHA Supply Chain Manager Division, um, there. Next slide, please. I actually would just, by the way, this presentation, I'm gonna give it like, uh, present like together with my colleague, Elise Bell, who's also online. Um, but just basically this presentation is just divided in two parts here. One is just uh, funding opportunities and uh, some other projects that we are actually doing on behalf of supply chain. Um, BHA, well, USAID is quite, is quite big and there are some other projects that are ongoing, but where we and supply chain, we don't have actually really control oversight of it. So I'm just gonna present something that we actually are doing ourselves um, on behalf of supply chain. So first of all is the funding opportunities. And this also very quite key on this one, because if you look like back about five to six years ago into our own supply chain, or BHA emergency guidelines, so where actually all the partners can actually apply or the guidelines for partners can apply for funding. There was nothing related to waste management or at least in terms of like supply chain, there was nothing related to sustainability, nothing. There was nothing in terms of like sustainable packaging, waste management, transportation, greenhouse gas emissions, absolutely nothing. It was completely omitted. And then you can see there was a evolution of like starting implementing, you know, some very, very uh, small changes in terms of like requesting partners. Like, hey, by the way, can you implement like if you're going to utilize uh, some funding from BHA, can you actually implement something related to waste management into your warehouse uh, system if you're going to utilize our funding and so on and so forth. And right now, as we speak, we have like specifically supply chain guidelines in terms of sustainability. Um, and they're very much like, you know, in sync as well with like DG Echo as well has and some other donors such as FCDO. So it's it's also a, you know, we don't have all the answers for, for all the questions and we don't have the solution for the uh, sustainability problems in the field. But I think there's at least like, you know, it's a welcoming, um, how do you say, like initiative or a trend, the fact that we are, putting more and more this uh, requirement into our uh, applications and funding opportunities. And there's also another funding opportunities like within BHA or USAID wide in terms of uh, partners that already received funding or not never received funding. They can apply for opportunities for funding when it comes down to sustainability practices. Um, we're also including, uh, since we were talking about waste management, waste management companies, uh, well, waste management organizations are mostly or 99% of the times are private sector entities or sometimes public sector, but private sector entities. So even within BHA, we're including this talk about waste management and sustainability with our BHA private sector engagement team, which is very key because if you don't have that buy internal buy-in, it's just basically we're just like the lonely, you know, division within this vast organization that's tried to actually implement something. So that's also getting a lot of traction and um as well as a lot of funding, which is very good. And also, you know, just by being here and having 55 people online and having DG Echo and, and other partners, like, you know, also to demonstrate that there is a coordination amongst donors and this topic, which is also very important because otherwise, if you're just, you know, it's just one donor trying to push like an agenda while all the other, all the others are kind of like just very, let's say, I'm going to say, well, use the word maybe, dormant to the topic, uh, which others like are right, like, hey, by the way, let's just keep moving. Um, you know, so the good thing is that everyone, a majority of, of donors are, are really like much in sync on this topic. And also, you know, when it comes down to specific funding opportunities to partners, for instance, we have the case even like, you know, recently like with uh, CRS and Madagascar. I think we have a hot mic there somewhere. Um, but Okay, um, and on CRS Madagascar, Elise, you want to talk just briefly about this one? Oh, yeah, sorry, I had to find my unmute. I see patience is on the line, but um, briefly for the CRS Madagascar piece, you've already 
undoubtedly received presentations on this, but the crux of this one is it's a really good example of a partner flagging for us a discrepancy in, okay, you're saying you want to conduct waste management related activities and that this is becoming an institutional priority, but how do we actually do it when rubber hits the road? So what we did with CRS was we worked, we understood the constraints that they were facing on the funding side and why they weren't able to propose these types of activities. And then this was on the Title II food assistance side. So anyone who works with BHA funding categories, um, we're here for you to talk with you and through it, and also to co-create maybe some ways forward so that you can implement these programs. Um, what we did was we essentially went to our policy and legal teams to advocate for why waste management related activities could be included under this very specific funding authority that I won't um, subject you all to right now, but it's just an example of if you see these things, we want to move from lip service to actually being able to empower partners to do these things. Um, so please flag these instances for us and we're willing and ready to work with you kind of side by side to see how you can add these proposals to your program. So thanks to CRS for being such a um, spearheading agent in all of that. Over. Great, thanks Elise. And uh, so just going to the, uh, let's say core of this presentation here, like that something that like we haven't presented yet. So this is quite new for everyone. Um, it's just, a, you know, going to the back to the subject of as well, like the, you know, just the, the two parts of the presentation. We here in the supply chain uh, division, we, um, since I cover like the Latin America Caribbean region, um, and we have the hurricane season that happens from June, July to up to like the end of October each, each year. Um, it's quite here, like you know, in, in next next to us here in 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 the U.S. Um, we were thinking uh, um, initiating a project which started like about three years ago, but like actually really we didn't have like a bandwidth to continue, but fortunately this year we actually managed to get some results. But essentially is this, the problem is that we had with the Caribbean regions that we have uh, uh, a region that is has a recurring disaster, um, um, is subject to a hurricane um, uh, disaster. How can I say that? Just, is prone to hurricanes in each year. We know that for a fact. Uh, we don't know like if it's going to occur or not. Luckily, like for the last three years, nothing really major happened. Um, you have limited ge geography. Uh, you have island nations and also uh, territories um, that are not actually harmonized in terms of like their waste management capabilities. There have been studies in the, pa in the past done before, but uh, nothing really comprehensive. You have different governments uh, also approaches and as well as motivations in terms of waste management in the Caribbean. And most of all, based on past responses is that we've seen um, not only in the case, for example, like Haiti, but also been some incident grenadines that happened with the volcano eruption is the fact that it's since it is a small, let's say, um, sometimes it's a rather um, very unique response that requires, you know, non-food items that you dispatch to the island, is that whenever a disaster happens, is that upon the dispatch of this and of non-food items, even though, even though you try to minimize your packaging, plastic packaging, everything, the impact on the island is quite large just because the island itself cannot actually cope with an amount of waste that's generated by humanitarian response. So that's also like the reason why we chose the Caribbean. It's just because, well, you know, it has this this uh, this problem, as well as one thing that we have in the Caribbean, we also have BHA footprint BHA that we also can actually analyze the, uh, the, the impact of the studies. And so, you know, moving forward in this one, like, so when we, do, you know, start like do this mapping, we say, okay, now what type of, you know, what are the waste and recycling capabilities of the region? What are some materials that are more easily recycled? What happens to materials that are recycled? Are recycled materials used to become, what, you know, what they are used or become trash somewhere else? Also very important because there is, for instance, the case of Dominica that has no more space for its own waste. So what do they do if actually uh, they actually collect waste and uh, just remain in the island or just send it on an island? So it's just basically transferring the problem. Um, and uh, what, are, what are transportation options to get uh, options to get recycling to the recycling facilities? And uh, what are limitations of the recycling supply chain? So we did all these questions. Uh, next slide, please. And we developed together with rec team um, a questionnaire format, uh, you know, in order to get like some standardization across and not actually develop our own questionnaire before approaching all these private sector companies um, across the islands. 
Um, and also very important to know that we only um, actually targeted like initially the island nations, not actually uh, territories, because then you're gonna touch upon uh, other type of policies. And uh, we actually just want to actually go for independent countries first. Um, and so we started like doing the desk research and just basically, you know, Google map search and uh, aerial image directories, Facebook, Instagram, because majority of companies as well, sometimes they're very, very small. They don't have any even like a website. So you have to go like numerous type of like sources, news articles. Um, and then it comes the part of like actually emailing, calling and, uh, you know, all that, which is also very tricky because these companies don't even know what USA is, or DHA nonetheless, um, as well as sometimes these companies also, their fear of being, you know, let's say this is the competitor actually calling me, trying to get some information. Um, so it's also very, very tricky to obtain, um, let's say, these type of like uh, um, answers. Next slide. So with all that said, um, I think it was like about three months of desk research. And I say like, you know, I want to emphasize desk research because like we want to do first like this type of like a remote uh, research in before actually doing type of like on the ground verification. And what we come across in the Caribbean um, is basically this type of heat map that we have right now. This is like for all like recycling facilities, um, non-medical. Okay, so this is also very, very important, like non-medical recycling facilities that we have there. And uh, you can see like this, the, based on the heat map, like we have like an uh, instance of Barbados, Dominican Republic, uh, Haiti, as well as Jamaica, Cayman Island as well, like while well, the other ones are kind of like a sparse. Also very important to note is that from, I think it was like about 150 companies, recycling companies, like being on actually um, registered on our um, database, um, but then also very important to note is that from the 150, uh, you have to note as well, like which ones are actually still available, operational, which ones are actually really true um, and not just basically like something that's just, you know, basically online. Uh, next slide. This is the kind of like the, the amount of recycling facilities, um, let's say per, per country, um, you know, this, this the, let's say there like you can see like there's of course like there is a um unbalance between um the amount of recycling facilities uh depending let's say where you are like uh, barbados has more let's say capabilities dominican republic has more capabilities but you say like well dominican republic is also bigger yes but also when you consider like the amount of waste that's produced like in the islands uh, you can see sometimes even, you can notice like it's not here in the map, but you also can see, for instance, like the case of Barbados or even uh, um, St. Lucia, they have more capabilities than St. Vincent Grenadines or Grenada. Grenada. So on that note, um, it's quite important for us to also to analyze, okay, you know, if, if a disaster happens and affects any of the islands, if these recycling facilities actually can cope, the amount of recycling facilities actually can cope with the humanitarian response affecting it. Next slide. All right, and specifically in Dominican Republic, and why is that you have like more uh, recycling facilities is because the government actually passed a law recently in terms of recycling and motivating recycling facilities, um, standardizing recycling facilities, as well as eliminating uh, single use plastics, if I'm not mistaken. Not eliminating, but I think there's like, um, uh, if I'm, I don't want to misquote here the law here, but essentially just basically motivation or standardization of recycling plastics within the island. And then again, that motivates again, like the private sector entities that actually has the recycling capabilities to collect as well as, you know, process it. And then also, let's say, um, do reverse logistics of these plastics into whoever's buying the plastics. And we can notice like from the Dominican Republic that majority of like PT plastics actually goes to China, Colombia, and Korea. Why is this so important? Um, yeah, sorry, it is it is misspelled there. It's Colombia, it's not Colombia. So, uh, our bad, um, but it's Colombia. And why, why is it so important this one? is basically goes to the point of like, yes, we are now like mapping out recycling facilities, but where actually that waste goes. And it not surprisingly, um, the plastic that's recycled and processed like, within each island goes to sometimes to a different location. We know, for instance, like that cardboard in Barbados goes to Trinidad Tobago, glass goes to Guyana, plastic also goes to China. 
uh, St. Lucia, the plastic goes to Honduras. Um, so where is it going? Oh, we don't know. So that's also the part of like the study as well. Like, okay, I'm going to map this, but again, we also have to map where all like this is also going because again, we don't want to just basically mapping just for the sake of mapping. And if the, a response happens, it would just like actually dump everything in recycle center, like in island X and don't write actually, you know, even caring what this plastic goes because maybe it's just going to be dumped another uh, um, dumping uh, site. So that's also very important. The next slide. And this is kind of just like a snapshot of uh, kind of just what we collected, like non-hazardous recycling companies across the islands. And you can see there is like a, a massive difference uh, between like uh, some island nations. Uh, for instance, uh, Grenada, you know, uh, San Kitts and Nevis uh, compared to Dominican Republic. And I know I mentioned like about the, the territories, but like just for comparison's sake, the British Virgin Islands, and you know, you compare like right beside like Bahamas, there is a big difference. Um, again, even though we don't want to touch like right now the territories, but just for the comparison's sake, we actually utilize some of the data that, that was uh, actually available online. Um, so that's again, we that's like just the first stage of uh, this whole mapping, um, let's say, initiative. Um, but we want to do now, and you can go to the next slide. What we want, before I touch like on the subject that what we want to do now, after we have all, all this material and all this data collected remotely is that based on our footprint also in the region is that we will try to also to verify this information. This is also very important because even though the Dominican Republic can have like 55 recycling, recy recycling facilities, how many of them actually really are according, let's say, to a standard that actually uh, humanitarian organizations can utilize upon a response. Um, so that's the next step, which I think was gonna probably take some time, um, but that's the, uh, the initial goal, right? So we have the information, we're gonna activate our, let's say, staff that's like available in the region, verify this information, and then upon this verification and having like an ultimate list and also share in the rack um, database. And by having that, what's the ultimate objective is that like having this waste management facilities in the Caribbean that are verified, that are somehow maybe even, you know, they know that like what the REC uh, uh, project is and REC database is, is that if a disaster happens based on a hurricane or non-hurricane or volcano or earthquake, Hopefully not, of course, we hope that never happens, but in case it happens, is that if there's like a massive humanitarian response that occurs and there is an influx of humanitarian goods, that are, you know, even though with minimum like plastic or has carb or anything, is that humanitarian logisticians on the ground can actually bring this to a recycling facility that they know is verified and actually know where it goes, other than just kind of like, oh, you know, just uh, bring it to the you know, dumping site, that's it, you know. Um, and I give you a very specific case, St. Vincent and Grenadines volcano that happened, I think, 2020. Um, the volcano just, you know, interrupted, like, basically it was a announced disaster and people were preparing and everything, but when it occurred, it, dam it damaged or actually polluted, like, the water sources of, you know, the island. And what the first request is from the government was, like, bring us bottles of water, bring us bottles of water. And what happened? A lot of organizations and a lot of governments brought, brought, brought the water. One was... Uh, actually the concern of like what the balls of water, you know, what we're going to do with the balls of water only occurred like about a week later when all the balls of water were in the island. And this is a very tiny island. So again, if that happens in the future, is that humanitarian logisticians already know where to go. And they know that the source of that waste management and recycling facilities is actually very viable. So, you know, the general patterns that we observe like on this whole mapping thing is that, um, you know, the, the when local governments, specifically like Dominican Republic, you can see like the shift of like, just basically you have a law that passes and the regulation and harmonization of like standards. You just basically like business actually wake up and actually really like pursue like a venue that, you know, they, they it's business, it's money, right? So they, they go and actually uh, uh, try to like go up to the standards of like in an international, it's international waste management standards, if I can may say so. But there is a push and there is a motivation by the private sector. Um, we also notice like in the Caribbean, there are other donors present, Germany, Japan, Taiwan. Um, and also like the, what I think like I just said as well, like in other uh, situations that we notice as well, like the Caribbean, like there's a lot of grassroots efforts, you know, plastic recycling, particularly like, you know, PET, scrap metal recycling, um, and also we identified as, for instance, like the uh, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, 
um, has identified, for instance, like Dominican Grenadas, particularly to stage the recycling uh, model demonstration projects as of 2023. This has never happened before. So it is a good trend, even from the public sector that is actually, you know, like initiative from its own governments, like trying to tackle the, the situation rather than us saying like, hey, by the way, can you do something? Um, which is also um, a good, um, let's say, trend to follow. Elise, have I forgot anything you want to mention? Oh, so much to say. Um, no, thanks, Pablo. You covered it nicely. I think one of the keys here with mapping is understanding the private sector footprint, but then understanding if there are instances in which they're not reaching our programs, what are the factors precluding them from going where we work? Um, is it just kind of economic bottom line? Are there regulatory barriers? Is it a financial gap in investment? And what we as donors might be able to do to help entice private sector partnerships or forge those linkages um, to a meaningful extent. So in the case of the CRS Madagascar program, we found that it was a simple supply chain intervention of introducing the Baylor unit, and then CRS worked with communities to stand up formal collection schemes. So that with the predictability of the waste streams, seems to be enough to entice private sector to go out to a remote area in the South that they wouldn't have gone to otherwise, at least on their own accord. Um, so we're open to brainstorming and finding solutions. If it's some sort of supply chain intervention, if it requires donor advocacy, who knows what it is. Um, but in any context, continent, region, we're ready to discuss. And um, yeah, we're gonna continue to map. So if there are countries that are of interest, um, building off of what the REC has done, also kind of tapping into our private sector engagement team here and our mission-based colleagues. Um, we're happy to support any efforts or inquiries that you have. But that's all from me. Pablo, back over to you. Yeah, nothing else from my side. Uh, thank you very much, Elise. Um, Marta, Catherine, back to you. Thank you so much. It's uh, been a very interesting um, presentation. Uh, and not only to see uh, all the effort placed uh, in uh, in these islands, that it's a clear example of the need of mapping. No, it's a, a good example also to um, to see the applicability of these maps to identify uh, capacities, maybe also for preparedness. No, identify capacities of the country or of the region and identify gaps. No, also for preventing uh, additional uh, problems. No. So, um, yeah, happy uh, to, we, we cannot discuss much more. Let's go to uh, the next step, but uh, I think that we will have chances to discuss more. So it was very interesting too. So now uh, um, we wanted to also hear from, from all of you, uh, from your expertise, from your experience working in the humanitarian sector. And uh, the key questions, we're going to do a breakout room. Uh, you will be automatically um, uh, sent to a group. Only will be uh, 10 minutes, but we want to hear from your insights after all the presentations, all the um, information shared. How do we think we can uh, build a more effective uh, waste management systems in the field? What is needed for um, the logistics sector or cluster or sector? What is needed from the humanitarian response? And what is uh, the example of engaging private sector, governments, etc.? These are good ideas that came from the participation. And I think that uh, now it's turn to, to hear from you. And we will come back in 10 minutes. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Opening the rooms now. Hello.
Hello. In the correct room.
Hello. <laughs> We're back. Okay. Was... Yeah, we. Uh, I think we've been moved back to the main group. <laughs> we, yeah. Okay, so let's see if now I can share. Yeah, I think we have to wait for Catherine. Okay, let me share the screen. Yeah, I'm I'm here. One second. Okay, sure. And we will check also the. And so I think that we are all uh, back. Uh, thank you for all your participations. Let's go quickly to do a, a maybe the, faci the facilitators can just quickly share which were the main results of the Manti and some uh, good ideas that came from the group and then we can open to the questions. Uh, yeah, uh, Michaela, please, you can just start. OK, I can start. I mean, from the first question, the main, uh, the, the, the two uh, um, points that were more uh, h higher in the ranking was the increase of awareness and the, uh, working on the technical specification. And this is also related to some of the points that we discussed in the second question. Uh, what can we do uh, to tackle this issue of waste management? And uh, many people raised the point of uh, educating programs colleagues. So starting from really uh, the, the beginning of uh, of the chain and also to uh, educate also local communities and so uh, always about this creating uh, increasing awareness and we talk also about uh, the donors constraint a lot of people uh, mentioned that that we need more policies minimum requirements and we were lucky enough to have uh, Anja with us in the meeting room who replied also that there are already these minimum requirements and uh, the, the, the organization themselves need to work in incorporating these minimum requirements. Someone also asked for a dedicated budget and uh, Johnson replied that there is not a dedicated budget because it's something that should be included in the several initiatives. Much more to discuss, but there is no time, so I hand over to someone else. Great. Thank you, Michela. Martin. Yeah, Paul, please. <laughs> Sure, yeah, so I think a bit similar in, in our group, uh, number one was capacity and awareness. Um, and then the second point was to develop further waste uh, to energy disposal options. So those were the two main topics. And then when we looked at uh, the second question, it was also a lot about education, awareness, um, there, there's a few points that came out as well, like government incentives, investment. So I think it's all in a similar, you know, similar topics. Um, and, you know, of course, the point about when we're working in the humanitarian sector, we're, you know, mainly focused first in the emergency. So it's how can we actually be prepared before uh, as much as we could to avoid any environmental mm -hmm. impact? Um, so, yeah, I think. I'll hand over to, um, well, I'll hand over back to you. Yeah, thank you, Paola. Maybe Francesca, you can go next. Yeah, so actually similar results for us, like coordination and, uh, uh, yes, collaboration and uh, um, partners, clusters, awareness uh, are the top two. What was extremely interesting that came out from the discussion on the second question is uh, discussions about uh, uh, single-use plastic packaging bans and also how to phase out uh, uh, this type of materials through strong green procurement policies. And one of the organizations, though, pointed out quite rightfully that sometimes uh, is the beneficiaries which ask for single use packaging for certain items because of uh, food uh, safety reasons. So this is, uh, of course, something to take into account that we need to balance with the uh, environmental procedures. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, yeah, for the last group, um, also the the key um, interventions that were ranked were awareness and also the idea of uh, having a strong coordination at the field level. Uh, similar, uh, some similar uh, in, uh, other uh, actions were shared, um, but also an interesting point was just to have a, a green focal point at the field level, maybe that can coordinate have an uh, uh, overview of the situation um, and also the idea of having partnerships with the private sector and the government uh, for the management of, of waste. 
and and also work more with the community and empower the the local community to to take also care some kind of lead and responsibility um so yeah thank you so much uh, we will collect all these results and we will share it we will work on them um but now we have like 10 minutes um Maybe, yeah, uh, we will have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, there, there have been some questions on the on the chat. Um, yeah, so we can uh, keep open the, the floor if there is any additional question. I think that most of them has been responded, but uh, we can open the floor if there is any additional question for our guests. Yeah, I think that if we are not wrong, all the questions were responded on the chat. I don't know if you have seen some that has not been responded. I think, Marta, mm -hmm. while you uh, while you look for that, perhaps I can just say if there if if anybody has questions or comments or you know you've identified any sort of gaps in uh, in in. In, in your operations and programs or things that we haven't necessarily tackled during this uh, particular global information session, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. You're welcome to, of course, also um, take the floor now, um, but we are always uh, open to addressing additional topics that are of most concern to you all. Uh, Anya, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, it's just because, I mean, there are no other questions, so um, so maybe it's also linked to the comment about the single use items. And I would like to ask uh, actually everyone in, in the call if they maybe have uh, positive examples of the use of cash and how the specific modality help reduce waste or maybe they tried and they failed because um, from DG Eco perspective, we are very... Um, convinced that, for example, cash for food uh, is the most sustainable um, solution. But we have mixed feelings, let's say, in terms of um, NFIs. So what is the, uh, if somebody has any good experience or if they actually seen the impact when uh, they went into a response to cash um, in, in terms of waste? This is a very highly debated topic in in the sector, so I'm just curious if somebody has um, yeah, some positive examples or thoughts about this. Um, uh, so, sorry, Anja. Yeah. Is there? Oh, sorry. Hi, Marta. Would you would you would you like me to answer this one? Sure, sure. Uh, Basil, please go ahead. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's a very, very interesting question and is really like uh, good. Uh, I've seen it myself in Yemen and in Iraq, actually, where we had to at least not to bring like if I may say it's not throwing the responsibility on someone else, but at least from our own perspective, not contributing to uh, increasing the waste or increasing our footprint on the operation. So instead in Yemen, when we were doing in kind, <clears throat> we we transferred portion of the beneficiaries to receive cash entitlement, which also increase, you know, like uh, the communication with the with the beneficiaries as well as like at least preserving the dignity of the benefici beneficiaries by giving cash uh, and telling them to go and collect their entitlement. We, in terms of waste, we didn't produce any waste. Actually, we just asked the beneficiaries or we went to the beneficiaries to the camp sometimes. And uh, we had these vouchers where where uh, paper, uh, sometimes paperless voucher where they we can uh, like register the beneficiary with the, with the with their own biometric and then give them back the, the cash entitlement. And of course, this is not only reduce the 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 waste produced by the operation, it's also produced uh, it, like very, very reduce the cost of the logistical operations, such as renting warehouse, transportation of the food to the 
final delivery point uh, as well, like uh, like having all these waste accumulated in our warehouses. So yes, if you're asking if this if this this con could contribute into uh, decreasing waste management, of course it does, and it also gives the beneficiary the uh, the option. Sometimes the beneficiaries they're not only seeking food assistance; they're seeking NFIs, as you said. They have babies, they have children, they want to buy some NFIs, of course, and they use that cash to buy these NFIs. A lot of people I, we've seen, uh, like in terms of beneficiaries in the in the field, where they prefer actually to having received cash entitlements over over the 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 food assistance or hygiene kits or any any relief items that we provide as a humanitarian sector in the field. So yes, I would I would add your voice, uh, add my voice to yours in like uh, defend defending this mechanism and like it's uh, I wouldn't call it cash for food. I would say like uh, cash based this uh, ca uh, cash based transfer where the beneficiary has the freedom to purchase anything with the food entitlement with the with the cash entitlement. I hope this answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is at least from your perspective as an organization, you have definitely reduced. Uh, the ways that uh, different distributions uh, were producing on on your own operation, then uh, the ways that was created by buying something, we we I guess we don't know, right? And uh, I guess it's also it depends. Obviously, if you distribute items that people don't use and then they get discarded, obviously this also helps in to our cause. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Thank you. We thank can you. just uh, see if uh, Martin. Uh, can, uh, uh, yeah, you have the hand up, please go yeah, ahead. I, I don't have a specific example, but you know, the question I would have is, you know, yes, we're reducing the waste within our supply chains, but uh, say using a, a, a case where there's refugees has come in and we're using cash and vouchers going through local vendors, we're just, are we just shifting that waste management, that waste? Because if I'm gonna provide some, a family with a bottle of oil, they're going someplace to buy a bottle of oil. So it's just shifting. There's still going to be waste. So how is that waste still going to be managed? And that vendor, well, where did they buy it from? What was that secondary packaging that came in and how are they using it? So is it really just shifting it or are there savings there? So it's definitely a good question that needs to be looked into. Is there any reduced waste being produced or is it just being shifted to somebody else? Thank you, Martin, for your uh, thought. Uh, let's uh, ask uh, Burku uh, if you can also yeah. share more insights here. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I may be the only academic here, so I wanted to. Uh, I I was very ha happy to follow the discussions. Uh, I want to make very short comments. Um, so I was glad to see that uh, in the second part of the questionnaire developing capacity and creating awareness uh, popped up as a like important issue i want to mention that uh, like research like basic um, small simulations and models can really help in that uh, i have been working with isups maybe there there may be people here uh, from the isups working group uh, we we worked on um, to understand the impact of postponement of branding relief packages recently, and uh, soon our results uh, will be there, like will be uh, disseminated among practitioners as well. And we show that if uh, organizations that are sharing the same depot, maybe regional depot, could postpone the branding of their uh, stocks, after the maybe occurrence or warning of an hurricane and stock sharing can occur and this can really lead to savings in fill rate, uh, supply chain performance, response time, etc. And this is an ongoing study for a few years and I have been thinking along this time like uh, this also has a lot of impact in, in terms of environment, uh, all these packages, etc., the standardization of items. I mean, there can be small steps uh, that can create uh, these, uh, like help greening the humanitarian supply chain. And uh, I represent actually a group of researchers here, maybe. So you can reach me um, 
if you are interested in conducting feature studies, if you want to check something that's, uh, that is uh, of interest to you. Thank yes, you so thank much. You. Thank you, Borg. Maybe yeah, you can uh, share your uh, contact details on the chat box. We can uh, reach you out for more discussions. Thank you and very interesting. Let's give the floor now to Sophie. Is the last question we can take because it's 4.30 already. And yeah, no, I, I it was just to add actually and to answer a bit to Basel uh, cash example in Yemen. Why like I, I, I agree with Martin or Ahmed, sorry if I, you know, I don't say your name well. While actually um, cash was good because yeah, you're right. It gives back the dignity ex and, and the trust, the choice to, to the person receiving the help as a head. But uh, going to some supplier, you know that there is no ban of plastic at all. And actually, I've been two times in Yemen with five years difference in between, and I have seen a real difference on plastic impact in south of Yemen, where now trees are just plastic. And then uh, just wondering how um, how to reduce that and how to, yes, to impact a um, in a positive way. And actually, I thought that on this way, for example, the food delivery direct was not so bad because we could actually ban the plastic from our call for tender while giving the cash plastic was everywhere one salad one plastic one concomber one plastic you know what i mean mm. well i trust just to add uh, this uh, testimony uh, while um, finding solution is not always easy <laughs> right. no no always thank you i think there. that that was helpful also as uh, as example of of uh, i think to, to respond to the question of anja and um, thank you so much so let me just uh, give you the last uh, message we wanted to share um, we are going to take all these discussion points and hopefully we will continue these discussions on the next uh, waste management coordination groups we want to set up. The objective is mainly to set up waste management systems at the organization, organizational level. So each session will uh, tackle one of the phase, uh, but we can also add other topics of discussion that we have started uh, uh, talking today. We will share the... And note of the record uh, survey of today information session. And of course, if you have examples or case studies or good practices on ways to energy or disposal or in general, all the different steps we've seen on the diagram of waste management, please, uh, you can share it with us uh, and we will also share it with the entire community. Thank you so much again to everyone. We just run out two minutes um, uh, late, uh, but uh, hopefully we can see you uh, and talk soon. Thanks so much also to our guests uh, and our colleagues, red colleagues, for their fantastic support. Thank you. Have a good afternoon and day. Thanks, Thanks so much. Much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.